but we're going to start off with the introduction. But before I do that, I'm going to ask uh, Sister Russell to pray to officially open tonight's service. Good night, everyone. Good night. Okay, let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this gathering tonight. Indeed, Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit in our presence. As we're about to get into study the Lord, to feed upon your word, Father, I ask, Lord, that you will grant us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding that we need. Father, I place before you, Pastor Moore, Father, who will be leading us into your word. I pray, Father, that you will surround him with your presence and give him the wisdom as unto us. And Lord Jesus, as we are here together, Lord, I pray that you will help us to be united, Lord. Help us to learn from each other, Lord. And Father, we humble ourselves at your feet. And we look forward to what you're about to pour into us, Lord. And we have, as you will fill us, Lord, so will we go forth and touch the lives of others in ways that you have desired us to do. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We adore you and we honor you. And we say we thank you that you're about to do to us and unto us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you very much, Sister Russell, for praying for us uh, tonight. So tonight I have two readers. We have Sister Tanya Ritchie and we have Sister Winsome Telfer. I'm going to ask Sister Tanya to go ahead and start us off with the introduction to the new uh, quarterly that we're going to be starting. And then I'll come back and then Sister Telfer will read the introduction to lesson number one. So Sister Tanya, I'm going to hand over to you right now. Introduction. Our task in the second half of Revelation is to identify Babylon and the role she played in the early church and in our world today. It is easy in a study of Revelation to spiral and crash into incessant finger pointing and name calling. China is the great red dragon. Russia is the beast out of the sea. The Democratic Party is the false prophet. The Catholic Church is the great prostitute. Or on the other side, our denomination is the bride of Christ. Your church is the church of Laodicea. Ours is Philadelphia. These as aspersions indicate a lack of study and understanding of John's letter to the seven churches of Asia. The entities represented by John in his visions tend to be much broader and more pervasive than a simple denunciation of people with whom he does not agree or views as the opposition. When Jesus was born to Mary and grew to become the awaited Messiah, it took people by surprise. They had expected a triumphant king who would lead them in battle against the forces of Rome. They anticipated that the nation of Israel would replace the Roman Empire under the rulership of the Mess Messianic king and earthly throne. On an earthly throne, sorry. But Jesus did not come in that way. He did not come to condemn, but to save. He came not as a lion, but as the Lamb of God. Is it possible that we make the same mistake do we read Revelation with a built-in bias, a presumptuous, a pre, a presumptions, presupposition that Jesus was in a bit soft in his first appearance, but when he returns again, he will come with a mighty wallop that he is going to smack down the earth and its inhabitants in a mighty display of plagues with an emphasis on blood, battles, debt, a mighty and destruction. God will really leave his mark at the end of the world. There are plenty of visions and imagery in Revelation to support such a picture. 
Yet our understanding of the end time must not forget to balance other images of God that are equally valid. In Revelation, Jesus remains more Lamb of God than warrior king. We are reminded through our study of Jesus, especially in the gospel and letters attributed to John, that God is love and that his followers are known for their love. This love is not only for family and friends, but for enemies and those who persecute us. We are reminded in Revelation that God is the God of creation. His purpose is to destroy those who destroy the earth. We remember that the ruler of the we remember that the ruler of the abbess is named Abaddon. Apollyon, both mean destroyer. This is the personification of God's enemy. Destruction. Will there be condemnation and punishment for those who refuse God and remain unrepentant? It is hard to argue otherwise, yet balance is also needed. The enemies that are most in focus in Revelation are Satan, harmful human institutions, spiritual powers, sin, and death. The victories that we will come to in the last half of Revelation are primarily against these destroyers, not humanity. The people of this world suffer at the devilish oppression of the mighty powers at work in opposition to the God we worship. The joy of revelation is that God is overpowering in his victory. There is an assurance of living happily ever after, but God does not destroy and wound with pleasure. He is like the shepherd looking for the one lost lamb. He is like the father of the prodigal praying for the return of his son. He is the, he is the God who had compassion on Nineveh when they repented upon hearing God's voice through Jonah. Unlike Jonah, who sulked in bitterness, desiring wrath, God forgave Nineveh and did not destroy it as Jonah had warned. As we take a closer look at part two of Revelation, we are reminded of its purpose. It was not written so we would rejoice at the destruction of sinners, but so they would be moved to repentance through the witness of the gospel. The movie industry makes apocalyptic movies to evoke terror and horror, but that is not the purpose of Revelation. Rather, it is intended to provoke the church through pity and compassion to reach people who have lost their way on the stress of Babylon, on the streets, I'm sorry. Rather, it is, to, it is intended to provoke the church through pity and compassion to reach people who have lost their way on the streets of Babylon. Some may live homeless on Babylon streets while others enjoy all the luxuries of the rich and famous, but they are all lost. The church has a street map of Babylon that its residents may not possess. It gives directions to the gate that exists Babylon, and that one and only gate is named Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you very much, Sister Tanya. I want to say welcome again to everyone on tonight's Bible study. We are at lesson number one. And we heard the introduction to this quarterly um, from Sister Tanya. And now we're going to be embarking on lesson number one. The topic is the woman and the dragon. The memory verse is Luke 2, 29 to 32. It says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have appeared in the sight of all nations, a light for a revelation to the Gentiles 
and the glory of your people, Israel. And the lesson introduction is to examine the identity of the royal woman and red dragon revealed in Revelation chapter 12. The scripture reading is Revelation 12, 1 to 6. And Sister um, Telfer is going to come forward with that reading for us. And then she's going to go straight into the introduction for lesson number one. So I'm going to hand over to Sister Telfer right now. Again, that's Revelation 12, 1 to 6. Praise God. Good night, everyone. Revelation chapter 12, 1 to 6. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and up on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto heaven and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Praise God. Introduction. In the celestial theater of Revelation 12, John tells the story of Jesus, the church, Satan, and the end. He begins with the central event of all history, the coming of Jesus as the messianic king. John records a vision of extraordinary signs in heaven. A pregnant woman in pain of child's birth appears, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown on her head with 12 stars. Then appears an enormous red dragon who stands in front of the woman with intent to devour her child as he is born. The ancient world would have immediately recognized this multi-headed dragon as Leviathan. The woman is best described, sorry, the woman is best identified as the people of God, or more specifically, the community of faith looking for the coming of the Messiah. Israel had a sense of pregnant anticipation for the coming of the Lion of Judah, who should save their nation. After the child's birth, the woman represents all who accept Jesus as Messiah. The church is born as the continuation of the Messianic people, now called Christians. The dragon seeks to devour the Messiah and kill the de developing church. Israel was familiar with the mythology of her neighbors, especially that of the Canaanites. Central to Canaanite, mythology was a multi-headed sea beast or dragon called Leviathan, a, person a personification of chaos and disaster. In the Canaanite myth, Leviathan is defeated or held in check by the storm god Baal, who helps bring order to the world. It is not strange, then, that the prophets of the Old Testament pick up the language of their neighbors to describe activity of the one true God of Scripture. Leviathan receives its most detailed story in Job. The question in this account is, why does Job suffer? Is it because of his sin or because God doesn't care about justice? In his answer to the accusation of injustice, God reveals that he is in control. He describes Leviathan, this mythical personification of chaos, disaster, 
and suffering as being on a leash, subservient to God like a pet animal. In essence, God is saying that chaos and disaster are part of the fallen universe we live in, and Leviathan has a purpose within it. Leviathan is under God's control, not outside of it. The metaphor of Leviathan is found in several Psalms representing God's control over the waters, including the parting of the Red Sea in the Exodus. Isaiah prophesies the defeat of Leviathan in the context of the rescue of God's people in the end time. In John's vision, we are told that this dragon represents more. The old serpent of Genesis 3, who is called the devil and Satan. The red dragon represents chaos, disorder, destruction, evil, the lying accuser, and all that opposes God's, God Almighty. The second half of Revelation begins with insight into the church's identity, purpose, and future. It's not a surprise that a story begins with the coming of Jesus and the opposition of the dragon to him and his people. But the role of the defeating, but the role of defeating the dragon is not the role of the church. God provides the protection only he can offer. Praise God. Amen, amen. Thank you very much, Sister Telford. At this time, I'm going to hand over to our teacher for tonight which is Pastor Moore. Pastor Moore, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Shelley. And others, I want to give God special thanks for you. Um, for, I think it was Sister Russell who prayed this evening, we thank God for you, and we thank God for Sister Tanya, and of course, Sister Telfa, who just read. Um, welcome, everybody. If you're joining us for the first time, this is our Bible study. We have this every Monday evening, and what we do is that we study the quarterly from the Church of God, Seventh Day. If you are not familiar with that, um we can post that in the chat for you. You can pick up a copy of it electronically and you can follow us as we go along. Um, we just completed, as Sister Shelley mentioned earlier, um, part one, where we looked at Revelation chapter one to chapter, um, is it 19? I think it is chapter 11, I beg your pardon. Chapter 11, verse 19. And so now we're picking up from there in part two, where we're looking at other sections of it. I did mention the last time that this is where we go deep into prophecy. And of course, I want us to understand that the time we spend here is not enough for us to get very deep into it. You have your questions, you need to write them down and um, so that we can able to see what we can manage. Now, I'm not sitting here telling you that I can answer all your questions because not even John could answer all the questions, so I don't know. All I'm saying to you is that you know, we can reason together and we can read the Bible together and understand what is going on. So I'm not sitting here as a professor who knows everything, but I'm sitting here depending on the grace of God to help us to understand his word. The, the lesson we're studying tonight, as I think it, it's a section that, you know, both readers read tonight, Sister Tanya and Sister Telfa, that it, it has to do with Babylon and the, the, the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, in reality, in a real world, Babylon conquered Jerusalem in 597 BC. And so that was the real and tangible Babylon. But the Babylon we speak of tonight is 
more so a spiritual Babylon that continues to have stronghold on the church. And this Babylon is now infused into what is called a system. And if we're not careful, we get swept away by Babylon because like Babylon back in the days who used a force and power and might and weapon to capture the heart of the people, today that's not how Babylon is operating. Babylon is operating in a more subtle way in that it is coming with things that people love. It's coming with technology, with sex, with the the with things, material things. That's what Babylon is using. And we have to be very careful. When we get deeper, when we talk about the mark of the beast and all of these things, we'll recognize um, Babylon. I also want to caution us tonight in terms of, because we're going to be studying about the coming of Jesus. In other words, the birth of Jesus. Now, I don't want us to see the birth of Jesus as Jesus just coming on the scene. So Jesus being born is not a new entry into the world. I want us to get that straight because in John 1 verse 1, Jesus it says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, meaning that Jesus is God. And so he was in the beginning. And he also said in John 8 and verse 58, when he was speaking to the scribes and Pharisees and they were going back and forth in a very tight argument. And he was telling them, you know, that they are the sons of the devil <laughs> and they are not sons of Abraham because of how they were behaving. Jesus told them in verse 58 that verily, verily, I say unto you that before Abraham was, I am. In other words, he existed before Abraham. So I want us to get that in our minds tonight, that this woman giving birth to the son who is Jesus Christ coming into the world, and not only Jesus Christ, but the church, because I want to extend it to the church. It's not about a Jesus coming into the world for the first time. Jesus represents for us um, God coming to mortal man and allowing man to have a personal relationship with God. That's what the coming of Jesus means. And he came and he set up the church on earth so that we tonight, all over the world, wherever you're coming from, can be a part. And the only chain that links us together is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. Nothing else. I would not have known you save for, for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We would not have been on this platform tonight, sitting together, studying and participating and you welcoming me in your homes and your cars and wherever you are. You're sitting watching me tonight. That would never have happened had it not been for the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, as was stated, that our task is to really identify Babylon, to see what Babylon is. Maybe some of us are living in Babylon and we don't even know it. We don't know that we're living in Babylon. So these lessons are geared to identify Babylon. Some people say that it is China, it is Russia, it's the Democratic Party, it's the Catholic Church, it is this church, it is all sort of things we're hearing coming across, but we're going to be studying that. And also what I want to do for you tonight is to give you some of the words that will come out of the lesson tonight so that when you hear them, you will have a clearer understanding. Call it, if you may, a vocabulary of words that I'll give you as it relates to what will come out of the lesson tonight. The first one is Babylon. And if you're writing these down, go ahead and write them. I'm going to try to go as slowly as possible, although we're running out of time. The first one is Babylon. And Babylon in this context, because remember that the words I'm giving you, they don't mean the same thing every time in all contexts. I'm giving you within the context that I'm, I'm speaking about, because 
in order to understand the Bible, we have to understand context. And so the first one is Babylon, and that means religious apostasy or confusion. Now you may ask, what is apostasy? An apostasy is when somebody abandon their faith or renounce their faith for a bit a, a different one. That's an apostasy. So talk about people apostatized. What they do is that they leave their faith for something else. So Babylon is religious apostasy or confusion. The crown, which we'll hear about tonight, it speaks of kingship, kingship or victory. Remember that the 24 elders have crowns on their head and it speaks of victory. The dragon, that word came up also, it is it represents Satan or his agency. And then the next word is head, head. And that word means major powers, rulers or governments. Head means major powers, rulers or governments. Then we also learn of horns, horns, H-O-R-N-S. And these deal with power and strength or king or kingdom. So there's a, a correlation between head and horn. And both of them mean practically the same. Then we also learn of moon. And moon has to do with perma permanence and a, a, a long standing, such as you remember when Joseph had his dream and he talked about his parents being the moon, the sun and the moon. It talks about foundation, light. So it's a it's a bright light that is from foundation. And you can look at it in a matriarchic or patriotic way as it relates to the moon. And the, and the stars, we have been studying this from chapter one. You notice that stars mean angels. And the sun means, it can mean gospel or Jesus himself, which means light. It gives light. Then we have witnesses. Um, sorry, not witnesses, but wilderness. The wilderness, and this has to do with a period of time. Remember that the children of Israel went through the wilderness. For them, it was God's pro protection over them. Can, so it can deal with a period of time. It can deal with the Old Testament, the New Testament, whatever it is. And the next one that we will see coming out tonight is woman. Woman. And that can be either pure or impure. So you have a pure woman and an impure woman. And this woman represents the church. They are also the apostate church, the church out of the church, the church which pulled itself out of the church and became the corrupt church. So all of these words, we'll be hearing them coming out tonight. Babylon, crown, dragon, head, horn, moon, stars, sun, wilderness, woman. All of these are some of the words that we will hear coming out tonight. I have said a lot, and so I want us to get into the lesson tonight to have some, some um, discussions from you. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your voice as we get into the lesson tonight and have some study done. All right, so welcome again. We're happy to have you, and we're looking forward to your participation. Sister Shelley, we're going to the first discussion question. And I'm going to be asking you to go ahead and read for us. And let's have that um, answered tonight. Welcome, everybody. Happy to have you. Question one. What do elderly people illustrate Israel anticipation for the Messiah in Luke 2, 25 to 38? What do we learn from them about Jesus and his destiny? Luke 2, 25 to 30. Luke 2, 25 to 30. 25 to 38. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem 
whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just a devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one, on Anna, the prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Aser, she was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Telfer. All right. Um, who's going to talk us through this? What is happening here? There are two elderly people illustrate Israel's anticipation for the Messiah. And when we say Messiah, who are we talking about? Because we don't want to take for granted who we're talking about. When we say the word Messiah, what does that Jesus. mean? Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. All right. Okay. And um, what do we learn from them about Jesus? So let's go with the first part of the question. And we're looking at what two elderly people illustrate Israel's anticipation. And this will be answered by my wife, Rhoda, who will come right now and respond to that question. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. So the two elderly people we're talking about in the passage is... Simeon and Anna. Um, so um, so we see where um, Simeon, he, he was the first one to um, recognize Jesus. And it would have to be that the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost moved him because I'm sure Baby Jesus looked like any other baby at the time. But the Spirit of God would have led him to, to, um, to Mary and Joseph and to baby Jesus and to recognize that this is the, the prophecy that he was waiting to see fulfilled. So in verse 29, we see where he said that he can now die in peace because he has seen the fulfillment of the, the Lord. And that the the glory of the glory of God has come, and He also blessed um, Mary. We also saw the prophetess Anna, another person not related to Simeon. She also um, was brought to Jesus um, by through the Spirit, through the Spirit of God. I I I suppose. And she, in a similar fashion, she gave thanks unto God. And she spoke about how he would redeem, he, Jesus, would redeem Israel in time to come. Um, what do we learn about them? So these two people, they were very old. And the, the scripture does not say um, at what point they were given this prophecy. But based on how they reacted, it seemed as if they were given this prophecy from a very long time. And I think it is also notable that a woman 
um, Anna, a prophetess, would also be um, spoken of. Um, I, I think it is very, um, what's the word? Instructive. Instructive, important mm -hmm. um, that they also mentioned her because it spoke about her husband. She'd been married for seven years and she was now 84 years old. So for a long while, she was without a husband, but she still continued in God and she still she was still elevated to the, the status of Anna. We do not we did not see a lot of women being um named in the Bible. And in this passage, we see Mary being in an important position as being the mother of Christ. And then we also saw Anna, a prophetess for so many years. So Simeon was very old. Um, and the way how he spoke about it, he said, I can finally die now. I can finally be at peace. And I think it was instructive that they told us how old um, Anna was, 84 years old. Um, so it would seem that they had waited a long time for this to happen and they, their hearts were fulfilled and, and overcome. So we see where both Simeon and Anna, and Anna, they both saw the salvation of the Lord and it, it did a lot for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudar. Go ahead, Sister Audrey. <clears throat> All right, good night, everyone. Just want to add to what Sister Moore says about um, the lesson that we can learn from about Jesus from these two devout Christians or devout um, children of God. Um, <clears throat> what appeals to me and to my thought was that when they spoke, uh, Mary and Joseph marveled and mm -hmm. then they explained to them what they were saying. And a part of that, they pointed to how they themselves will suffer anguish because of the child that they brought into the world. Um, he, he was to be the redeemer, Sister Moore says, of Israel, to redeem back Israel to the creator. He was also to become sin for us. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what I get from it. Jesus became sin for us. And... He is also the way, the truth, and the life. And so Mary and Joseph ought to understand that the child that they brought to the temple was going to cause them some pain and anguish because his purpose and his destiny was so much different from any other child that was ever born on earth and that was born during his, during his time. And so um, they prepared them for that. He was supposed to, his destiny was Calvary because he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Amen, 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 amen. Now, you know, for for those who know cricket, the sport of cricket, we would say that that was a very good innings and um, very good batting in the first innings there coming across. Thank you very much for sharing. Remember that we're studying the topic, the woman and the dragon. And I went through the words so that you can get familiar. Once you read it, these words will pop up in your mind again and say, oh, this is what this means and so on. Because I know going through Revelation can be a challenge for some persons. So I, you know, went through those for you. All right. Thank you very much. Question one was well answered by both of you. Thank you. All right, so we're moving on to question number two. Sister Shelley, could you go ahead and introduce question number two, two also? Question two, read Psalms 2 and Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. How does Revelation 12, 1 to 6 fulfill these texts? What do they tell us about the identity of the Messiah? The Psalms 2. Sister Toffrey, you can go again. Read 
Rita, where are we? I'm okay. sorry. I'm I'm talking unmuted. I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay. Psalm two. Um, from. What from the verse verses? Caleb, one. so have you came Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, non anointed saying, let us break their, band, their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, shall laugh. <laughs> the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heat then for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O, o ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled up but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Thank you, Sister Telfer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for reading for us, Sister Telfer. Um, so we're looking at the question, how does Revelation 12, verse 1 to 6, fulfill these texts? And what do they tell us about the identity of the Messiah or the Lord himself, Jesus Christ? So we heard Psalm 2. Anybody reading Psalm 2 for the first time? Is it the first time you're hearing Psalm 2? And what in Psalm 2 that give you that link in fulfillment as it relates to, to Jesus Christ? Give me a verse, anything at all, quickly. We don't want to spend too much time on this. Any verse, any passage in this that link Jesus as it relates to Revelation 12, verse 1 to 6? The woman came, the woman gave birth, the red dragon was there. And all of that, anything in this passage that is linking you to that from Revelation, anything? I'm going to go past the more. Go ahead. Um, seven, seven and eight, I will declare the decree the Lord had said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the even for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. It is telling us, it is linking what is happening in Revelation 12 with what Jesus will accomplish when he, when he came or when he comes. Because mm -hmm. God said, you are my, I, I will give you thee the even for thine inheritance. And then he also said, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy position. And here's why I said it. When the devil came and took away ownership from our four parents, Adam and Eve, right? He began to boast himself about he goes to and for the earth, showing that he owns the place. But here in this text, God says, he is, you are my 
um, begotten, and I will give you the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So he was taking back what the devil stole. Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord, church. Amen. <laughs> very good. Very good, Sister Audrey. Very good. Very good. Very good. I want also to point out something in Isaiah chapter 9 that many of you may not have seen before. Point on it, Sister Shelley. Verse 6. For unto us, what is it? A what? A child is what? Born. You notice that? But then the other clause said, and unto us, what? A son is what? Giving, given. So the son was not born. The son, Jesus Christ, was not born. And that is the point I was making from beginning. That Jesus Christ was from the beginning. So the son of God is not born. The son of God was given to us. But it was a child who came in that form in order to have a relationship with man. He came as a baby, but he was not so you, in essence, we can't talk about Jesus Christ was born. It's really, it's really not a correct way to say it. If we look at this passage, it's a, the correct way to say it is that the son of God was given to us and he came in the form of a baby that was born to us. That's what, that, that, that's what the, the correct format would be. So this, the child was born and the son was given. And to us, and it goes on to talk about the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Those are names that tells you about a kind of a rule and leadership that Sister Audrey does mention that is going to take back from this enemy called the devil. Because our four parents, Adam and Eve, sinned, they messed it up for us. And so we're going through all of this today because of sin. But here comes Jesus Christ into the world to arrest that dragon and to take back from him his people and to set them on the right path. So every earthquake, every disaster, everything is the bid of God to turn the heart of people towards him. Last week, we listened to the testimonies and what came out of that was that persons were saying, hey, it's amazing how, or frightening, let me use that word, how people will see all of these disasters and still not turn. It's sad. And so, you know, that tells us quite clearly um, what you tell us about the, the, the identity of the, the, the Messiah. That is what I just explained, that he is from everlasting. He not just come on you. He has been here for a long time. Before time, he has been here. So a son is given to us. A baby is born that bore his identity. And that is why he was the son of God and the son of man, all in one sinless into the world of sin that he came into the world. That's his identity. Quickly, let us move on to question number three. We're moving steadily. Thank you all for your participation. We're going now to question number three. Sister Shelley will introduce that one for us again. Question three. How many heads does the red dragon have? Mm. What's the significance of this and their crown? Crowns in verse 3, what is the intent of the red dragon and why? Why does this, what does this tail do and what does that mean in verse 4? Right. Verse 3, right. and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. In verse 4, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did pass them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So it had seven heads. Yes. Go on. 
what was the other part of the question? Can you pull up the questions? The significance of, of, of this and their crowns. It's talking about the significance of their crowns. I don't know that one. I'm willing to learn that one. <laughs> I don't know what it's <laughs> All right. Very good. All right. So let's get into it now. All right. So <laughs> what this is, we're talking about now the red dragon. Remember when I went through the list, I said that the dragon represents what? Dragon See? represents Satan, correct. The devil himself, Lucifer. It represents the devil. All right. So the red dragon but he has seven heads. Now, remember what I said the heads mean? What does head mean? mean rulership. Rulership. Ruler. Ruler. Government. That is right. Yeah. Ruler, Power. government. Authority. Authority, all of these things. And this signifies... The crown to be kings? Yes. The right. crown, right. Kingship. So it has the crown, kingship or power. Yes. Right. Power. Along with the horn, because I remember I said that the horn and all of these signify power and kingship mm. and all of mm -hmm. that. And so mm -hmm. all of these know. So what happened is that this dragon recognized and know that there will be a change in the world with Jesus coming into the world. That this will bring a kind of a, a threat to what he came down to do. Because let us jump down to the part where his tail Drew, you read that part too? It was verse yes. three? Right. Verse so four. You read that part. So that, what that means is that when he was thrown out, and I guess next week we're going to be studying that, when he was thrown out of heaven, because mm -hmm. he didn't just ask to leave, he and Michael had a war, and Michael won and beat mm -hmm. him up mm -hmm. and threw him out of heaven. Mm -hmm. And when he was coming out of heaven, about a third of the angels traveled with him and that that's a star that is why the scripture said a third of the stars which represents the angels came with him on earth so when he came to earth and 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 start to go around and start to behave as if he was in charge the threat of jesus coming onto the earth now to the to deliver man from sin that Adam and Eve brought us into. Mm -hmm. Now, put him into panic mode. And so what happened, he's now going to work through humans and man. And let me explain what that means. Because one of the things that I expressed some time ago in this study is that God by himself could have delivered us from Satan a long time ago. It doesn't take anything for God to wipe out Satan right now. Nothing. But what God wants to do is that the fact that he sent man, he created man in the beginning, and man failed. If God by himself wipe out Satan and get rid of him, the war would not be fear. Let me put it that way, in a human term for you to understand. God will have to use man to deliver Satan and to conquer him and to put him on the feet. So man is what God is using this moment to get rid of this dragon because man failed. And so God is looking for a man or a woman to conquer the devil and to get rid of him. And so what is happening is that when we see these crowns and these, all of these, these are powers that the devil is raising up against the church. So you're going to have kings who are going to be raised up against the church of God and they are going to be coming with their principalities and their powers and they are going to be trying to fight against the church of God to bring the church of God down so the devil is not just coming by himself he's coming with different heads of governments and heads of this and heads of that who will gang up against the church and we're seeing it today in that there are so many opposition against the church and the organization of laws and all of these things that are planned against the church that is geared towards killing the dream of the church, but it cannot be killed. 
we, we, we're not, we're not going to be conquered. We're more than conqueror, Paul said. And so this is not something that we are going to be timid about. This is something that we're going to glorify God about. That with all of his heads and with all of the crowns on the head, because the head don't just don't have heads, but they have crowns on them. And which means that they have authority, they have power to declare and to demand this of the church and try to, to, to bring down the church. So it is, it is an orchestrated war against the church that the devil is trying to come with. Go ahead, my sister. Your mic is not open. You had mentioned Babylon in the definition part of the introduction. And mm. then so I want to ask you, because you now say that he's going to raise up some kings. But I was thinking that he would have raised up king from Babylon, from the time of Babylon. And I'm talking about real Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar was, was king of Babylon. Right, mm -hmm. because you said that these these heads means powers and rulers. So we are taking it from ancient Israel time, from back then, the Old Testament time, and we're going to bring it back into New Testament time. And right. so the, the 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 um these heads started from back then. Then I'm asking because in the Babylon time, you remember what Babylon did to 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 in uh, Jeremiah's um. When they took the children and the things of God, the host, the, 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 the help me, the, the, the vessels. The vessels. Talk about the vessels. Right, and what, and he took the golden best vessels and they went there. and, right. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, 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 and God's people. So it started to me, it started from that time, and it is coming right down to the end. Mm -hmm. Where the church from that time, the Old Testament church, and and those people in that God's people, because you also told us that church means God's people. The woman means church, right? Yes. And so from that time, the 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 the, the red dragon raised up these rulers from that time to persecute God's people, and it is going to come right down to our time. So we need also to understand what God's people went through at that time and how they stand or, or stood fast to their fate. Right. Yeah. One of the things that we must point out as it relates to that natural time in Babylon too was that the, the, the people of Israel got a lot of warning from people like Ezekiel, from Jeremiah, and all of these prophets, they warned them. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah was one of those people that they tried to shut up. In fact, they put him in a pit and tried to shut him up when Jeremiah was telling them, look, you need to be different because the day is coming when this is going to happen. Babylon is going to come. And they never believe it until when Babylon came and fully controlled and Babylon set up a figurehead king in Jerusalem to rule. And the, the king had to be, the king had to be, listening to that to, to, to Babylon and to rule. I've also made the point earlier, which is very important, that we may not see within this time, within this short time going up, a kind of a physical struggle, but more a spiritual one and a and a psychological one, if you may, where we're going to want to go the route of Babylon because Babylon now represents a system and so whilst you have a physical confrontation where people were taken physically and you have Daniel and those men who went with them into captivity, we may now have a kind of a spiritual Babylon that we're struggling with. Look at how people are dressing nowadays. Look at how people who are, or people, what people are eating, drinking, listening to, um, People don't care. So it, it's a spiritual Babylon that wants to come and illustrate the, 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 the mind of God's people and to take over the mind of God's people. And it is subtle because some of us, we love to talk about, nothing wrong with it. What is wrong with it? What is wrong with me listening to that? 
What is wrong with me listening to that music? We love to talk that. We love, we love to say that. And we don't recognize that these are some subtle little things that tend to want to attack the Christ inside of us. And we give space to it from time to time. And we have it on our phone. We listen to it. We go to bed with it sometimes. Some kind of music. And we watch some movies. And we're not recognizing that these are the systems of Babylon that is set up to destroy us and to pull the very Jesus out of us. The similar thing to what happened in, um, in physical Jerusalem. When when Jeremiah and all others, Ezekiel was one of them, walked naked for a certain amount of years, lay on his side for a number of, of, of years. All of that, that they displayed, put on display, what would have happened to Jerusalem, and eventually it happened. And so today, what we're seeing is a spiritual attack on God's people. And we need to wake up and, 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 and smell the coffee so to speak. So how many heads? We have seven of them and we're going to get into later on into what these heads represent. Not tonight mm -hmm. because we're just touching on the prophecy part of it. We're going to get into that. The significance of, the, of their crown. In other words, they are coming with rule and leadership. They are in control. These are not just, these are not just petty people now, you know. These are not just some people who don't know what they're doing. These are people with power, and they have it. What is the intent of the red dragon? The intent is to destroy the church, is to bring down God's church, to totally destroy it. And what does his tail do? His tail drew a third part, which I mentioned before, the third part of the angels that came down with him from heaven. And of course, those now represents his demons that are moving around and creating havoc in our lives. Go ahead, Sister Audrey. Yes, um, just permit me to add to this. As you were talking about the spiritual attack, and then and you talk about the, the tail. So mm. he took one third because he knew that him by himself couldn't manage mankind. Right. Simple as although they said that we were made a little lower. He by himself and he's not omnipresent. Yes. And so he took, and I'm learning because I'm, you know, I love I love the word of God and I love to see what's happening. And I'm not afraid to listen to the the, the devil worshippers and those people and their experience. So I've just learned, I've learned recently that they are they are not omnipresent, but they are able to what they call astro project, if that's the word. I think it's the right terminology. And so he took one third of the angels and they are helping him. So he yeah. has created an army out of God's angel, holy angel, turned him into demon to fight because he know he saw what happened. He can't beat Michael. He didn't beat Michael. He wanted all of the angels, but he only got a third. And so yeah. he's able to through them on a spiritual level that you talk about. Yeah. Come and persecute God people. And you know, Pastor Moore, I'm just going to say this, whether we like it or not. You see, when Christian join with demon to work up some little things to get them away with people and in people's life, is a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. Yeah. Because, let me tell you something, they are not easy and they are wicked. And we ought to understand that this spiritual war as Christians, we ought to be careful where we are. We cannot be on the river and in the oil, oh, in the river and on the bank. Okay. We have to know where we are and who we serve because the intent of this demon was not to come and help us and to be nice here and nice there. Their intention was to come and destroy the church, which is the people of God, and to destroy Jesus Christ and his work of salvation. Sister, Sister Shelley, we're going to ask Pastor Ling to help us out with number four. I haven't heard his voice, so I want to hear his voice on this one. And um, just to, you know, give us his perspective on question number four. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and, and read question number four. Just to back up something Sister Audrey just said, is that um, there are a lot of people who don't understand 
demons and the power of demons. And sometimes what we do is that we, we bring some things into our homes through television, through what we watch, what we listen to, and we don't recognize that we're bringing these demons into a home. And it sound good and it sound harmless. The words sound all right, everything sound good. But these are avenues that demons travel through. And we attract them. Mm -hmm. And the jewelry and all of these things. And what we don't understand, and I'm not against jewelry. I'm not saying people not to wear jewelry. That's not what I'm saying. So don't go and say, Pastor Moore said, don't wear jewelry. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that some of the things that we listen to, wear, whatever, they are, they are, they are designed with demonic powers in mind because the devil, he comes, as John 10.10 10 says, he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's his job. That's his aim, to come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So those of us who are playing around with our Christianity and we don't recognize that we're in a war, tonight I want us to recognize this, that this is a war that we are in. It is not a plaything that you have a devil who hates you, literally plan every day. This devil have your name trying ways to defeat you every day. Whatever your name is, as long as you are saved, whatever your name is, you listen to me. Every single day, this devil, write down your name and plan ways how to defeat you. Every day. And if you are not strong in Jesus, he's going to get you down. <laughs> I'm telling you that. Sister Shelley, go ahead. Introduce the question for us. Pastor Leng will respond to this one for us. Go ahead. Question four. How does the Old Testament depiction of the Leviathan informs John's picture of the dragon in Revelation 12? Mm. Scripture reading is Job 41, 1 to 34, Psalm 74, 12 to 15, Isaiah 27, 1 to 3. What do these texts teach us about what Leviathan represent and its relation to God and his people? Thank you very much. Pastor Lynn, your turn. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Yeah, I don't have my book yet. Okay. I hope you're seeing it on the screen. I'm not sure, maybe. No, man, I was up there, but that's fine. Okay, okay, okay. All right, now, this, this creature, I think this is, <laughs> he appears in drug more than anywhere else. People have tried to picture the have artist depiction of this monster right but <clears throat> the truth is I don't I don't quite know why why the writer went there mm -hmm. that they're trying to connect the dragon in mm -hmm. chapter 12 with this monster mm -hmm. but the, the fact is that the nature I think it's the nature of the creature that causes the comparison to be made because we already are told who this dragon really is. It is symbolic of the devil who is also the serpent. But we know that Job had his own encounter. He had his own spiritual battle. And the fact that we are zeroing on this spiritual conflict mm -hmm. is very important. Because any engagement with the devil has to be at the spiritual level. We are not up against flesh and blood. So Satan, we know he has is well organized. His kingdom is well organized for destruction. So in the same way, God's kingdom is organized for our salvation. 
Satan's kingdom is organized for our destruction. And so he, he, he actually uses the same type of organization that God has. And that is what makes him so dangerous because he is trying to unseat God. He is not content to be on the sidelines or to be in opposition. He wants to take charge. So this, this Leviathan, it actually is, is presented as this difficult <laughs> creature to get rid of. <laughs> Right? It seems that it can metamorphose into different states to suit the condition because you realize that Satan is both depicted as a dragon and also as that old serpent in one in the same verse. So this Leviathan creature actually is presented as being tough, very difficult to get rid of. Just like this dragon. But God has a remedy for every Leviathan, for every dragon, for every serpent. And so this conflict right there is what the, <laughs> the whole of our struggles is all about. Mm -hmm. So we have Revelation 12, we see the seven the dragon, seven heads, ten horns, and they take us to Psalm and Revelation, sorry, and Job, Job. where Leviathan Job. is presented right. yes, as the formidable creature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But 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 it's just a depiction to show the similarities. But but there's no doubt in Revelation as to who this dragon is. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. seven heads and ten horns, as you have said. Mm -hmm. represent the instrumentality or the agency through which he works to get his job done. Mm -hmm. Right? And then it was a question I was saying that, 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 that... So how does the Old Testament depict the, the Leviathan um, form John's picture of the dragon in Revelation 12 and so on? So All right, you... so I'm saying it is it is it is from that perspective of its of its fortitude. Mm -hmm. Remember that this dragon is actually waging war against God, against God's people, mm -hmm. and so on. And yeah. this Leviathan is tough yeah. and difficult to overcome. Yes. Right? Yeah. Right. So it is it is that connection that is being made between the old testament. And what we have in Revelation chapter 12. <laughs> All right, but 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 the dragon and Leviathan stands in opposition to the people of God. Yeah. And we know we know once you're talking about opposition to the people of God, we know who we're talking about. No yeah, matter nice. what creature they use to describe him, whether it is serpent, dragon, Leviathan, wh whatever it is, yeah. it is that devil. All finger points to the devil. Yeah, man. At top four. Yeah, man. And Amen. the truth is that he's only he's only one antidote for the devil, and it is Jesus Christ. That's his right, son. Mm -hmm. But but you and I know that in the philosophy is if you can catch Kwaku, you <laughs> catch <laughs> right. So, yeah. so that is that is the philosophy. So the war that we are encountering or the conflicts that we're having, yes. it is not that it is really us yeah. that the devil is against. The yeah. devil is not against flesh and bloody. The devil is not waging war against flesh and blood either. <laughs> but yes. but the blood. people who God loves actually are enrobed in flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. So that is how the attack becomes painful for us mm -hmm. because we are still in this mortal frame mm -hmm. that is subjected to pain and so on. Notice that when, when the conflict ends, mm -hmm. we are no longer in any mortal frame. 
this mortal is going to put on immortality, immortality. right? So we have to pay great attention to our spiritual profile. We have to pay attention to that. And I, and I said a lot of us spend both a lot of time and a lot of money on the physical, we're not demeaning, we're not in any way trivializing care for the body, but we ought to give far more attention to our spiritual development. How are we thinking? Where our mind is? What is our focus? What is driving us? And so we have to understand that because that is where life, the real life is. That's where the real battle is. That's where the real victory is. We must get victory over the mind. The mind is a serious battle, will you? And whoever controls the mind is going to control us. So, but the, but the war between the devil and the people of God is actually what is at the forefront of this. Leviathan stands as an enemy in Job's case, and the dragon with the seven heads and ten horns stands in opposition to the people of God in Revelation. But in every case, the victory belongs to God and the people of God. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Deng. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to, as I go to Sister Audrey, I want to bring, um, I'm not sure if you can see this, Pastor Green on question five. I'm not sure if you have access to it, sir. I, my intention is not to set you up in any way. So if you can't see the context of it and the contents that is there, I can understand if you are not having access to it, Sister Shelley is going to bring that to you. So um, Sister Shelley can copy you and so on in the meantime. But, you know, thank you, Pastor Leng, dealing with that quite nicely for us. I have something to say about it. Let me just quickly make a point quickly, Sister um, Audrey. We're running out of time. We have about seven minutes and we have something else. Oh, my to God. Oh, yes. I just want to, uh, you, you know, when I read, I read the, the three passages and as Pastor mm -hmm. Link said, um, the monster. But here's where I found hope. Because mm -hmm. when you read the other two, you know, it sounds scary and it seems as if we have no hope. And I just want to add this because I did study. It says the Lord will punish with his sword. His fierce and great and powerful sword. The, Levi the Leviathan, the coiling serpent, the coiling serpent, he will slay the monster of the sea. And pastor, I asked Google what sea in prophecy mean. And it says multitudes, people, nation, tongue. Sorry. And from that, I get hope that God, I don't care all the dragon tough in my case. And I don't care how him can butter and bruise me. But my hope rests in the fact that in Isaiah 27, 1 to 3, it said the Lord will punish the monster with his mighty and powerful sword. And who and it's the monster who goes after the people. And that includes me. Amen. Amen. I like, Amen. I like that. Brother Sean, I hear you. Um, uh, brother, uh, you know, right. Job, Job, God gave Job one entire chapter, if you may, explaining the Le Le Leviathan. And right. when he asked Job, because Job was there now in himself after in his sore and suffering and loss, and he was now asking God some question and then God started to ask him some question and God stuck on this animal. God stuck right there. It, God didn't move from that chapter, chapter 41. He says, canst thou draw out the Leviathan with an hook or his tongue with a cord which thou let us down? And then God went down. He talked about his scales his nose, he talks about, can you play with him like a bird? And everything, there's this picture that is painted 
where God has this, as Sister Audrey was saying. This little demon in his hand and can do anything at all with him as he may. Can wrap him around and do anything at all with him and, and to get rid of him in the last as she read Isaiah dear. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sharing. I want to quickly run to my good friend, Pastor Green, if you have a word you want to share on question number five. If not, I understand quite sir but i really appreciate your presence with us sir i do appreciate it and i just want to have you you know have this opportunity to share with us tonight go ahead sister shelley go ahead read the question for us and let's get a response from pastor green question number five how does john specifically identify the red dragon and how does it appearance here brings the bible story full circle Revelation 12, verse 9 in Genesis 2. Three. Three, sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Pastor. Hi. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? I'm hearing you quite well, sir. Perfect. Good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to join and to uh, share a quick word. I recognize that time is far spent. Maybe next week I can give a, a more defined response. But right, in, in short, the the, the the, um, the corresponding themes of Revelation 12 and chapter th and Genesis chapter 3. Uh, mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 3 speaks about the serpent, which mm -hmm. deceived or beguiled the woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think most of the, the students in the Bible here tonight know that obviously that was the devil, Satan, um, that deceived the woman. And of course, the man was disobedient and plunged the world into sin. The corresponding action here is in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, it places the assumption that we are speaking of one of uh, the, the, same per the same creature. So the serpent, according to Genesis chapter 3, and the dragon, according to uh, Revelation chapter 12, are one and the same. Here in chapter 12, we, the depiction, as was mentioned earlier, is that he deceives uh, a portion of the holy uh, uh, angels or beings in heaven, and they were cast out with him from heaven. And of course, uh, part of the narrative is that he, his, uh, I think you mentioned earlier, his desire was to corrupt God's creation and so having not the ability to overthrow Michael or the ability to overthrow God and seeing there was no place found in heaven for him and having been cast to the earth, I'm talking fast, sorry. Uh, the scripture said, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth for the devil has gone down and he hath great wrath. Another text says, what I see Satan falling from heaven like lightning. So these are all corresponding texts. And like I said, next week, I, I know you're out of time, but I hope I can give a better, um, or once we get into the more descriptive elements of Revelation chapter 12, um, then we can uh, we can speak more closely to that. But bottom line, the narrative is the, the red dragon and the uh, with the tail that drew a third of heaven um, and the serpent in chapter three of Genesis are one of the same and the function and desire is the same. One is to destroy the church, the woman and uh, the child or the ministry that he came with. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. Most welcome. I appreciate that. All right. Very good. So we, as we, as we recap, and we look at the final question tonight, Sister Shelley. We're looking at, we want to remind us that we're looking at the woman and the dragon. And this, this, this is a contrast between the world and the church, between the devil and God himself. What I think, if anything, one other thing that I think I heard, it was Sister Audrey who shared, that it is God who's going to defeat him. And that is what um, question six is pointing to as we close. What does a royal woman represent both before and after the birth of her, of her child? 
And what does she do to stop the dragon? The woman can do nothing to stop the dragon because the woman, as rightly as Pastor Green just said, represents the church. And I spoke about that earlier when I gave you the vocabulary words. The woman here represents the church and the church really by itself can do nothing to stop the dragon. It is God who can stop the dragon. Our place is to stick close to God. So it's like your parents. You're going out with your parents. Pastor Green, you must remember this. Going out with Sister Green. And she hold your hand very, very close. Because she didn't want anything to happen to you. No car to hit you. You didn't get lost somewhere in a crowd. Anything. We stick close to God. And God will fight the battle for us. Because we can't manage this devil. It is God who can fight the devil for us and to conquer him. Go ahead, sir. I'm so sorry. I, I made a, 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 a an error in statement. Um, my belief has been that the uh, the woman is actually Israel. Okay, I'll explain that. I'll explain my position on that, which is not yeah. far from what we had said because I did say the church. Right. All right. right. Maybe next week I can provide a, a proper clarity. I got sorry you, and I that. want you to come and do that. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Very good. So the woman, the woman there, and so the woman herself cannot fight against the dragon. And as and I'm looking at question six. Who does the royal woman represent? Pastor Howard says, look, it represent Israel. I believe that coming out of that is a part of the church, but we'll hear about that next week. Both um before and after the birth of the child representing because of course israel played a big part in all of this because we must understand that that is like the epicenter of the church if you may that's where it all began that's where it took place and so that's where it, it came out of but the point i'm making as we go tonight and i see a mic open brother sean i'm going to give you an opportunity the woman could do nothing to stop the dragon absolutely nothing and there are times in which and i think that this is instructive to us because there are times in which we believe that we can stop the dragon and there are times in which we believe also that we're strong enough that we will not be defeated by the dragon that's a false belief and that is something that we need to be careful of that we don't get so caught up within ourselves because we feel strong today because we preach a strong message or we pray a strong prayer or we sing a song that bless people, we believe that we are able to fight against the enemy. We depend solely upon God. And it is God himself who is going to lead us through. Brother Sean, go ahead quickly as we close. Yes, sir. I just want to add that um, the that her feet are on 12 stars. I can't help but to believe that that starts out as the the 12 tribes of Israel and the moon um, represent um, all of the feast days are on lunar calendar are off of, you know, that's where you get your timings is your lunar calendar. And then later, obviously, and, and when, um, when the child was born, Jesus was born, it was of the, it was the Jews. I mean, he was of the, of the, obviously he was a Jew um, himself. However, later the church, um, Israel, when it talks about Israel, we have to be careful because sometimes that Israel is the church that it's talking about. And so I believe that that did, there comes a time when that woman is the church and that and and always was but it changed it um was opened as we see in acts it was open to the gentiles so it's one in the same it's one in the same so both both are correct in my opinion that's of course as you said earlier so i'll leave it at that and yep. look forward to pastor green's commentary next week and and further study so thank you Thank you very much. Right. Definitely. And and I believe that, as you rightly said, that we, we have to be careful in terms of um, because physical Israel and 
and and what they are today and represent today and spiritual is, yeah amen is far from from what god intend them to be and i so i believe that the church has played a strong role in coming and claiming that so although it did not initiate with what we refer today as the church but the church has morphed itself into this kind of relationship if you may and become a part of that pastor Leng, please yeah just quickly as a to answer it it says before and after so so it is telling us that the woman is actually representing two different situations yeah so there's nothing wrong in fact the bible refers to israel as the church that was in the wilderness yes. so we don't really have a problem so but, but definitely after the child the woman is the church Yes. Before the child Amen. is Israel. That's right. Yeah. Right. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I love the discussion. I love it. I love it. And I'm I'm looking forward for more. I I really enjoyed this evening. Uh, we looked at um the woman and the dragon. And I want us to walk away this evening, brethren and friends, to walk away with us, as it says, the lesson objective to examine the identity of the royal woman and red dragon revealed in revelation 12 as it comes out of that and i want us to walk away this evening with the understanding that there is a devil there's a devil there's a dragon that is out to get you and this dragon is vicious and he's not there to to befriend you just to be your friend and to give you nice things. No, it's to get you down. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus is there, and Jesus is ever conquering, and he will never lose a battle. He cannot lose the battle. And so we're on the Lord's side. We're on the side that will never lose, never, ever lose a battle. And so we give God special thanks for tonight's study. We thank you all for joining us. We thank you for sharing with us and for giving us your attention. For those who listened, for those who participated, for those who will listen this recording going, going forward. That we serve a God, Sister V, who will never lose. He cannot lose the battle. Never. And so I may be down today. I may feel down I may feel like nothing today, but at the end of the day, we serve a God who will never lose the battle. And he's the one that is fighting for me. I can't fight for myself. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I don't want to preach it now, so let's stop. Amen. So thank you again for joining us. And remember, as always, love what Jesus loves and hate what Jesus hates as you go Allow the Lord to be the center of your life and that all things will be accomplished through him. God bless you. Sister Shelley, over back to you. Thank you, Pastor Moore. And I want to say thanks to each and every one that came on tonight. As I always say, and I'll say it again, your presence do make a difference and we appreciate each and every one of you. Tonight's clothing thought, it says, Revelation 12, 1 to 6 may be the scariest part of John's letter. God's whole plan appears to be in jeopardy as the dragon attempts to put a sudden end to Messianic hope. Happily, we find that the dragon meets his defeat as we move to the second half of the chapter in our next lesson. At this time, I'm going to ask Sister Pamela Moore um, if she's available to go ahead and pray to close for us tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Praise the Lord. Thank you. God. Eternal and most holy God, our Father, we come in your presence another time, Lord, to give you thanks, to praise you, for your goodness and for your love, for your mercies towards us. We thank you, Holy Father, 
but it's another privilege that we, your children, can meet together to study your words in order to equip our souls and to equip us for the coming days ahead. Because we know that the dragon, the devil, the enemy of our soul is always on the attack and is trying to overshadow your children with darkness. But Holy Father, we thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit that you have given unto us that we can study your words, dear Lord. And you have pr provided um, people, oh God, equip them with wisdom, with knowledge and with understanding that as they study your words and be able to impart them to us, the listeners, oh God. And as we uh, take them in, dear Lord, we let them be, as the psalmist said, the lamp to our feet and the light to our pathway. So we thank you for explaining your words to us through your Holy Spirit and through your power. We pray a blessing upon the teachers, oh God, as you equip him, dear Lord, and you bless him, dear Lord, with the understanding and the wisdom of how to impart your words. And all those who participate tonight, dear Lord, and those who are able to explain what others do not understand and what we do understand, help us to live by them and to let them be the guide to our feet. Have mercy upon each and every one, dear Lord. We know that the dragon is always setting out, oh God, to distort your words and to turn things around and to blindside your children into believing things that are not true. Praise be the name of Jesus. But thank you for the light that you have been shining throughout these lessons, dear Lord, that it is equipping us and is guiding our feet, our heart, and our mind. Most importantly, help us that we constantly study your words. We constantly read your words prayerfully and with the intent of learning more and more and to be able to stand firm in the truth. Lead on, O King Eternal. Bless everyone online tonight, O oh God. I'm praying, dear Lord, and I'm hoping that each and every one of us, every night as we come together to listen to your words, to study your words, we leave way refreshing and determined, O oh God. Not let the devil keep us down, not that the devil destroy our minds, but we keep focusing on you, keep our minds stayed fully upon you, that whatever we learn will equip us for the days ahead. Bless this um this lesson tonight and bless everyone, oh God, and strengthen us in the work and in the words of Jesus Christ and fill us up with your Holy Spirit so that we'll never run dry. Praise be the name of the Lord. We'll never run out of, of, of ammunition against the evil plan of the enemy. Because as it is said, we cannot de de defeat the devil, but you are within us, Lord, and we are more than able. Praise be the name of the Lord to, 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 to defeat him because of you. So thank you for being with us tonight. And may you watch over us. And for the rest of the week, will, these words will be ringing in our minds. And these thoughts that come to us, dear Lord, will be ringing with us and will lead us forward. So that at no point, at no time at all, with devil, as he tries to destroy us, will try, will, will defeat us. Have your own way now. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you and we bless your holy name. Bless all the ministers online. Bless our um, sister Shelly as she lead forth, almighty God. Bless the readers and bless everyone that participate. And may we continue to trust and to love and to listen to you and to walk therein. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Sister Moore. Have a blessed day night everyone and a productive week and as pastor morse said while closing love what jesus love and hate what jesus ate we'll be back next monday um 8 p.m for us in the u.s and for those in jamaica 7 p.m we'll be back next monday god's willing thank you so much have a good night good night, good night.